welcome to the Borealis Experience. I'm your host, Aurora, and I'm very excited to be posting this interview for you with John Esteen and Reginald Joseph, a conversation among warriors about guys who are so inspiring and they share just such beautiful stories. We will also touch on racism and how Reginald approached a very racist situation back then when he was 17. Enjoy our conversation and I'll be out there very soon again for you. Bye-bye. Okay, I'm John Esteen. I am the founder and president of e and Second Wind Nonprofit Organization. I have served over 20 years on 150 years sentence on a nonviolent drug charge. Now that I have my freedom, I'm working towards helping others, serving them, and helping them the best way that I can. Beautiful. My name is Reginald Joseph, and uh, I live here in Florida. I am um, a father of six. Uh, each and every one of them are grown and uh, doing well. I, um, I guess I linked up with John Esteen through my brother, who played football with him in college. He knew, them, he knew him from college. And uh, I've been on this path of uh, motivating and encouraging people for a very long time. It's, I think it's been my life calling to be that type of person. And uh, so I was on, on a mission uh, to get some things started here. And uh, my brother introduced me to John. Uh, I don't know how the conversation went between himself and John, but um, he told John that he needed to uh, meet me. So when we linked up, uh, I immediately noticed that we had a lot in common. I'd never served time in prison, but I've uh, faced many adversities uh, out here in the world. And uh, it seemed to put us on uh, basically the same type of path, uh, wanting to give back, wanting to encourage, but also wanted to see people reached the pentacle of success in whatever form or fashion that may be, whether it uh, being released from prison or being encouraged and empowered uh, during their time in prison, uh, as well as out here in the world, uh, being able to uh, maneuver and manipulate situations to the point where it always empowered myself or empowered that individual, encouraged them to do better and be better, and to be a better example to, to the youth. Uh, I think that's very important that uh, we talk about, we always talk a good game about how uh, the world is changing and what things need to take place for this other world, but we never emphasize or emphasize enough the importance of education and educating our youth. And that not only goes with classroom education, it's about our morals and uh, educating them on uh, having a higher self of, uh, self-esteem. Uh, we're going to all face adversities through every day of our life. There are things that uh, we go through just to get us to the next point. And I just believe that if we encourage through our, uh, our life experience, I go through things, but you don't have to know what I'm going through because of uh, how I react. Uh, you got to see me encouraged. You got to see me happy. And that there is going to encourage you and uh, give you a sense of uh, empowerment that you can do it too, no matter what your situation is. And I think that's how John and I are both um, kind of motivated uh, to see this thing go and to help as many people as we can. That is so beautiful. And the Borealis experience here is also about showing to the world that there is such good masculine role models out there because I feel there's a lot of men in power right now that misguide their their power their influence and they misuse it and use it against women and guys and mm -hmm. this is why I feel it's so important to have you on my show because especially when it comes to you John There is so much judgment when it comes to um, people who came out of jail. Like people say, no, that person was bad in the past. They will never change. They have no chance in society. 
And I want to change that image. I want to show people that people deserve second chances and that there is strong, beautiful, masculine role models out there. And we just got to focus more on there. We have to take the focus away from these aggressive bullies and put the focus on guys who have really good intentions and who have learned from their mistakes. So, John, if you want to maybe share a little bit more of your story and how you got back into society now and maybe some of the adversity that you have encountered and maybe beautiful experiences um, that you uh, went through now that you're out there in the world again. Yes. Um, it was not easy going to prison. Um, it, I think it all stems from me coming back from war. Mm -hmm. When I came back from war, I couldn't really find myself. I was lost and I was looking to see what direction to go in. And unfortunately, I got hooked up with friends that were doing wrong things. And I had got a hip to doing things like that while I was in war. So I was, I did things at war in Saudi Arabia that I have never done in my life. Mm -hmm. So it kind of brought me to, it kind of transformed me to another person, a person that I wasn't brought up to be. Mm -hmm. So when I came home with that same uh, mindset, it was easy for me to fall in the traps of doing things that I don't supposed to be doing. And it led me to doing my first um, tour in prison. And that was uh, Pensacola, Florida. That uh, softly feel is a federal prison camp. My first uh, conviction ever, a young man, still trying to find myself. And I did three and a half years there. When I came home, it kind of like scared me straight for a little while. I was married to, I married my, my uh, wife, a young lady that I met in college when I was playing football with Mr. Well, with Reginald's um, brother. Uh, so I'm home now and I'm working. Everything working out good for me. And I just got, got tired and I got people. I met new people that was doing what I did before. Mm -hmm. So quite naturally, I kind of leaned towards that way to make extra money. Mm -hmm. It's all about me. It was about making extra money. It wasn't nothing else. Mm -hmm. I just wanted, uh, I guess some people say it was selfish motives. And I do believe that too. But um also had... Good intentions. I want to take care of my family, my son. You know, I do have a son. He's an attorney now, so I'm proud of him. Despite my downfall, he he persevered and became a, a, a fine young man. You mm -hmm. know, so I'm proud of that. I'm glad. I'm thank God for that. And um, so now that I'm home, came home from the, the federal penitentiary around, I say ninety five in 1998. I caught my second charge that led me to Angola State Prison. It was at one time the most bloody prison in the world. And it seemed to uh, calm down a whole lot since we had a, uh, a warden by the name of Burl Kane who changed the face of Angola with, with church, with religion. So that was a good thing. Mm -hmm. So when I get to Angola, you know, it was kind of a shock to me. It was like it was on a world of his own. And I just couldn't believe I was in there. But it had a lot of distractions while there. Mm -hmm. And I know I had 150 years over my head that if I don't do anything about it, my, my faith would end right there, right there in Angola. And um, but what triggered me, now we never I, now, I talked to Reginald, and uh, I realized that I realized that what triggered me to fight the way I did for my freedom. And that's when I was uh, a color guard in Angola. I uh, had a veteran program. And what we did, we buried our own. 
you see. And I mentioned that to you before. And uh, but as I reiterate that, it's another thing that came up to my mind was that when that when I seen that man that we buried going in that Angola ground, that big old dark hole, and it touched me. I like I felt his pain. I felt his family pain. I felt it just came something came over me that brought tears to my eyes. And I felt also, I realized that at that moment, it's like the old me was dying with that man in that ground, going on that ground with him. Mm-hmm. And that changed me. I was prior to that. All I was doing was playing sports. Uh, the good thing I was doing is getting educated. I got into Bible college that they had in Angola. So I got my uh, bachelor's degree in Christian ministry. Then I, then I got a horticulture certification. So I was doing positive things, and I was a leader there in Angola. So I taught a lot of classes there, leadership classes, you see. So all that add up to, like, what am I going to do? I'm going to lay down or I'm going to get up and fight and gain my freedom the best way I know how. And I decided to fight. And with that moment that I saw that guy being buried, it touched me that much to make me grow up at that moment, be a man and stand up for myself and don't have no pity party and and get in the law library and learn the law as it pertained to my situation and put God first. I have to remember, I I put God first. I learned that with God, all things are possible. And I stuck with that. And I believed that my whole heart. And I knew that God worked through us, not for us. So knowing these things helped me on, to stay on the straight and narrow and to focus on my freedom. Mm-hmm. That's mine. Beautiful. Um, you want to start a podcast where you encourage and motivate people and with Reginald you guys want to want to start a big project would you guys like to share with us I'm gonna let, I'm gonna let Reginald talk about that yes <laughs> yes please he helped me out a lot he helped me out a lot with my non-profit filming things cutting pacing and it's, he he does some beautiful things for me and I like to him to elaborate on that Yes, please. Well, my thing is, I've always been a writer uh, since a kid, but um, I'd like to comment one thing on on what John was saying uh, as far as laying down or getting up and fighting. Um, I think you have an uncanny ability uh, to block things out. Mm. Uh, One thing about me when I run, I can run. I used to run in the military, and I would... Uh, when I went to ranger school, I was always the guy out with the guide on. I would run up mountains and I was I could run distance. Yeah. When it wow. came to running laps around a track, I couldn't do it. I was I was very ineffective basically because I would count those laps and how many more I had left. And it would really cancel it out for me. So I was very ineffective at running. But if I got out and I had to go uh seven miles. I, I didn't have miles to count. I just ran. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? And what you did was with 150 years, in my opinion, because I've never had to uh, experience it at that magnitude, but in my, my, my opinion, 150 years, most people would just settle, would just give up, would lay down and say, you know what, there's no fight left in me because what am I going to fight for? 150, uh, commute this. I, this is what I got to do. I'll die here, right? Yes. But you failed, you, you refused to lay down because you were able to block that out. And I applaud that. that that's an ability that uh, I, I hope I can find in me at some point uh, to that extreme. But as far as... Uh, the big project. Um, I, um, my, my whole, uh, I guess, makeup has been to help people, to give back, uh, to do what I could, uh, to be a selfless person, uh, 
selfish in a sense that I put me first. I, my happiness is important to me. But to be able to be of value, everything about me must be of value to other people, to help them grow, to help them get better, to help them see better and to do better. And uh, working with John, I see greater possibilities in everything that I want to do or that I need to do or aspire to do uh, because we have a, we, we have like mind. Uh, we're like-minded individuals. We have a lot in common as far as a military background. Uh, he went to prison, but I, f- I was, um, I faced adversity in the sense that my father didn't raise me. He went out and he adopted another family and he denied my brothers and I. And uh, he, grad- he, he, he retired from General Motors 33 years. Uh, we never saw any of the benefits. My mother saw not a lick of child support. And uh, it, it hurt me uh, all the way through my adult life. I was searching for my purpose. When I always knew what my purpose was, it was just hard to grasp mm-hmm. what my true purpose was without that father figure. I had a mother, a single mother raising three boys and trying to be men she couldn't do it so naturally as the oldest I got into trouble I didn't have a father there to teach me uh, how not to make certain mistakes or how to make uh, better decisions so I had to learn a lot on my own Uh, but uh, one day I um, came to a point where I was I was sick and tired of being sick and tired if that makes any sense to you uh, yes, I was 17 years old and um, I got kicked out of high school for fighting and it was a senior year and I told my mother that I wasn't going to transfer to another school. I was just going to get a GED and I said, you know what, I'm going to go to the Army. Forget college, I'm going to go to the Army. And um, the day I was having that conversation with her, uh, I got the knock on the door and I knew who it was, but I was surrendered to what I was going to do. I was done with the old stuff and I was, I was on to something better. And so I opened the door and they told me, let's go, man. And I was like, nope, not doing that anymore. I'm done with it. I'm going into the army. And when I closed the door, this is the last time I saw them. Those guys, they wound up, there were two brothers. They wound up in Angola for 124 years of peace for what they did that night that they came to get me. That's right. 124 years with no chance of parole for two counts of armed robbery in the state of Louisiana at the time, it was 99 years max sentence and 25 years minimum. So they got two counts. Um, And I went on and my third day in basic training, I was used in a very spiritual way to change a man's life. He was a racist. He was a professed racist and he was saying things and everybody wanted to get him. And at 17 years old, I didn't know much about life. I didn't know much about, you know, scriptures and Bible or anything like that. But something in me rose up and I was able to go over and have a conversation with this man. And he he was an older guy. He was like 27 years old with a wife and kids. And I was just snotting those kid off the block. I didn't know anything about anything. But the conversation between the two of us left him in tears. And he became one of my best friends in life. Changed his life from being a racist to embracing diversity. And that's what I, I'm, I'm, I'm drawn to that. Every time I talk with John Estein, I'm drawn to memories of that, of my purpose is greater than what, I've, what I could ever imagine. I, 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 There's so many great things that I'm still yet to do. And being that we're the same age, we we're kind of mm-hmm. that timetable is really, it's like, we don't have to race. We don't have to rush. We don't have to fight against it. We just have to relax into the flow of it and just be who and allow things to come together. So the podcast, my podcast is Choking on Cigar Smoke. Um, and Choking on Cigar Smoke, you know the, uh, um, the phrase, uh, close but no cigar? Mm-hmm. Choking on cigar smoke means that you want it so much that you can't even handle it. You don't even learn how to handle. So what we need to do is take our time, be patient and focus our efforts on being positive and happy. And 
educating ourselves and therefore educating the youth. Therefore, the recidivism rate, which John's mission is, it's curbing that recidivism. rate. It's, it's kind of uh, bringing the, uh, diminishing that where there won't be as many people going in and out of prison uh, and things of that nature. And it's really cultivating and saving the family aspect. Mm-hmm. So that's what my goal is. And to, I think we're going to make uh, a powerful statement in regards to family, in regards to education, in regards to the recidivism. Rate. Yeah, this is such an incredible mission. And I know you guys will make such a big impact and, and change in society um, all around the world. And one thing I wanted to add to that is when it comes to criminal energy, um, John Esteen, like said, he was very selfish. He wanted to, yeah, earn a little bit of money, but it was to be a provider. You wanted to be a provider for your family and help support them. So with a lot of people who commit crimes, I feel they are extremely intelligent and, and know how to function and organize and, and network. And then they get into jail and most of the time horrible things happen in jail that mm-hmm. so that when they get out of jail, they're completely lost and don't know what to do. But if you can now channel that energy, that energy that was misguided at the start channel into goodness and helping others then you can create incredible things and I feel this is what you guys will be doing you will pick up guys who are lost and maybe broken and give them a purpose and give them a sense of self and make them feel needed in our society again because that's what is lacking right now people come out beat up and then are forced through administration and are being judged by other people. And you guys are kind of the, the supporting net who can receive them and help them into a new direction. Did I get this right? I think so. Or, or may I add also uh, to the point where John, uh, his son, Uh, becoming a responsible individual despite his father being sentenced to 150 years in penitentiary. It was because of your refusal to lay down, your work ethic, your constant aggression towards doing something proactive. Yes. That was constantly teaching your son. He couldn't give up because he wasn't being taught to give up. He was watching you and, and being empowered. So he can't give up and he'll pass that on to his, his offspring yes. and, and all those around them, they'll, that energy will, 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 will transfer into their lives if, yes. if they so desire it. But I believe that it's uh, just like I said, my value is not only for me, but more importantly for those around me, especially mm-hmm. my offspring and my, and that's why I believe you and I attract so strongly because we share that. We share that same sentiment of a positive, strong work ethic and the refusal to quit. I just, I just can't quit. At 53 years old, man, I, just, I, got, I got more energy than I did at 20. Exactly. That's real. I, I truly do. My <laughs> thoughts and my, I get so many wonderful thoughts on how to, I mean, business and, and just everything. I got into a PhD program because I couldn't stop learning. I was just, I, I finished my master's and I was like, okay, I'm done with learning. Then I went and got a master's in screenwriting. And I said, okay, I got to do something with this. So I thought I'd get the PhD in psychology to kind of change the way things work in Hollywood. Then I met John Estee. And then my purpose was was reborn it seems you know wow. yes this is what it's about uh, so yeah i agree with everything you said or and i agree with everything john said and end uh, up i'm i'm just more than happy to be on this journey so beautiful and you did, that, Rich. <laughs> <laughs> and you did <laughs> the same good thing like John Esteen did for his son, you did for your children and making that huge decision that night 
that you're not going to go out and commit a crime, right? Mm. You had the wow. power to say, no, I made my decision and I'm going to the army and it's going to give me structure. And that was such a huge, huge decision that your children yeah. would look at and, and feel so inspired by it too. And it was only, it was only uh, three and a half years later that I had my first child. Three and a half years later. So, I mean, things work out uh, the way they're supposed to, I believe. But you have a, a specific responsibility to ensure that it does go through at the moment that it's supposed to go through. If not, I mean, it's not to say that it won't happen, but it's going to take some time to get back to it. And I feel like the obstacles on either side, yeah. the obstacles on either side, They're yep. there. My focus should be on my goal. Line my purpose and my path with the goal. And those obstacles won't be a distraction to me because I don't focus my attention on those obstacles. I focus on my goal. My goal. Those obstacles are going to be there regardless. Yeah. If I put time into studying and being depressed and being sad and angry, I'm wasting time. Time is something you can never, ever, ever get back. So I'm going to put my time on realizing my goals and, and focusing on my purpose and then things will be fine. That's what I believe. Mm. And um, I just got really good news that our Zoom meeting can be extended a little bit so we don't have to okay. stop in five minutes. That's awesome. Maybe it's right, the content that that's so bad. great. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. And, um, another thing um, I like to uh, express too is the guys that I was in, incarcerated with, um, they all need some type of positive influence, leadership. And I thank God that he allowed, he used me for part of that. Mm -hmm. And when my case hit and, and they see all these guys seen my whole walk for 18 plus years in Angola and to see the end result of it, the end positively, it changed, it changed many of their lives. Mm -hmm. And I'm, and I'm thankful for that. And I give God glory because it wasn't for him. I wouldn't be here talking to either one of you today. I know this because mm -hmm. I know I'll be stuck in that trap doing what John Esteem wants to do, but I ain't do what John Esteem wanted to do. I had to put what John Esteem wanted to do and put what's more important is what thus says the Lord. You see, and I, I learned that. And I and you, you benefit more, <laughs> of course. Um, but it's one thing that stuck out to me, one inmate, because a lot of inmates went home on my on my case mm -hmm. before I did. And I never went home on my case. <sighs> So I want to clear that up too. I never did go home on my case ever. I'm still on parole right now. I have 80 years of parole because I have 80 years left to serve because I left 80 years early because they paroled me out. I had 150 years. I did 20. So they leave me, you know, with the rest. You see? And um, and that's crazy. I know. And I'm still fighting that. But there's one inmate out of all of them that went home before me that really His name was Cushinelli, this Italian guy. Old, old, my, I guess he's about my age, but he was just, he wasn't in, he wasn't in healthy condition. He was in a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. And I never knew my case affected him. He was on the East Yard and I was on the West Yard. So we don't really see each other. Okay. Even though we're in the same area, but it's separated. I was going to see my lawyer this particular day about my situation. I was waiting in the line and, um, It's close to where we visit at and, and connected to the visiting is the medical. Everybody has to go to the medical before they go home. They have to do a checkup and everything, blood work, every, the whole nine, everything. So this particular, this guy was going home on the Esteem case. And as he was being pushed up past me, I didn't know. Had a couple of guys also waiting for their lawyers, asked Cushionelli, Man, where are you going? And he said, man, I'm going home. And they asked him, how are you going home? What, what happened? What, what case you use? What, what, 
What's going on? He said, man, the Esteen case. He said, Esteen case? Well, Esteen sitting right there. He said, what? So he turned, got the guy to push him, turned his wheelchair around and came to him. So I got up and walked towards him. He, was, he, had his, he kind of a little chunky, little white guy, you know, a little Italian guy, had his little ball cap on his head. And he said, Esteen, come here. So I walked toward him. And I said, man, look, go enjoy your life, man. God is good. And he said, can I shake your hand? I said, yeah, sure. So he grabbed my hand and put it, placed it down here on his chest by his heart. And he put his head down. And I felt a number of tears of, of water on my hand. And, it, and, and tears come in my eye because it was a moment that touching to me, you know, to see a grown man cry, you know, or something that God gave me the wisdom to overcome. You see? And I never forget that moment. And that's why I'm doing what I'm doing today. It's because of a moments like that. Mm-hmm. You know, you know, people are showing how they appreciate and will go. And man, it, it's blow, it blows my mind. I got chills right now just telling you mm-hmm. because it's so real to me. Mm-hmm. It's so real. You know, it's like also when I come out the gate, get my freedom, my mom and dad, they're waiting on me to see me cross that threshold. From bondage to freedom. Freedom. Can I say something right quick? Yes. I, I don't want to cut you off, John, but right. you're saying <laughs> some things, man. It just 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 giving me energy, man. Um <laughs> yes. You said that you wanted to do if 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 it wasn't for God, you would do what John wanted to do. Mm-hmm. It's because of God that John is doing what John wanted to do. John wanted to be this way all his life. John had to go through trials and tribulations and places and through Amen. people to get to where you are right now. Mm-hmm. Tell me about your mom saying what she said to you in court that day. Man, that was that, that was the fire. beginning. Okay, <laughs> mm-hmm. that moment mm-hmm. with 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 the Italian guy, Cushion said his name. Cushion, Cushion, Cushionelli. You'll never forget that moment. Right. You'll never forget the moment when you, they told you. You were going home. You'll never forget the day you got home. You'll never forget those moments because they are going to keep you in subjection mm-hmm. to your purpose. Yes. And that's wow. what that's what that's the kind of stuff I'm telling you that I feed off of. Mm-hmm. Those types of moments that I never forget that that still draw me up. Look at you, man. You got tears in your eyes right now yeah. because of those right. moments. You'll right. never forget them. They're going to keep driving you to fulfill your mm-hmm. purpose to fulfill right. your purpose every single day. And that's a sure. great thing. And it's not because of not, you're doing what you want to do. Mm-hmm. Everything that we go through, the Bible says that all things work together for good, right? Yes, right. Everything you've ever experienced is working out the way it's supposed to. Mm-hmm. Some of the things that, some of the decisions you made cause you to have to endure certain other aspects, but mm-hmm. you are right where you're supposed to be. And you've gone through everything that you were supposed to go through for the particular purpose. And some of it, we don't even, we haven't even realized yet. It's greater. Greater is coming. Greater is coming. And all these moments are preparing you for those greater moments, leveling up. Right. Yes, sir. Exactly. I appreciate that, man. See why is my encourager right here? You see that? <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> encourager. Well, <I'm> <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. So beautifully said. And if I can add this, there's um, tree seeds out here. We have pine trees where the seeds have to go through fire in order to ignite, in order to grow a new tree. And I feel there's people out there, and I think all three of us are those, those kind of people. We had to go through hell, through fire, in order to unlock our purpose and to be the people that we're mm-hmm. supposed to be here. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. it's so incredibly precious to, to have you guys here. Like I have goosebumps all over me. <laughs> yeah, likewise. <laughs> yeah, same likewise, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah uh, I've been having them. <laughs> and and I, sure. feel, I feel for all three of us, again, the moment we realize that if we don't fight for ourselves, We're going to let so many people down. We're not going to live our purpose. And in not doing so, 
we're not going to be able to support others. And the moment we realized, oh my God, we can help someone else to freedom and happiness is mm. so empowering. And, and you feel like you cannot give up. You have to fight, not only for yourself, but for others too. Yeah, yeah I agree. Every everything, everything, even the things that you said about how uh my Facebook messages, I uh, encourage you, uh, the things that John said, um, that is just more, seems like ammunition being put into my, uh, into my weapon, um, <laughs> uh, more encouragement, more strength, more power, you know what I'm saying, to yeah. go out and combat and fight against uh, the adversities uh, that people experience every day, the systemic racism, the injustices, all these things. Uh, it's like, You can't push my button unless I put it out there. Exactly. So I'm not going to, when I wake up in the morning, my first thoughts are positive thoughts. My last thoughts before I go to bed are positive thoughts. Uh, and that reinforces when I wake up in the morning, I'm waking up with positive thoughts. I get up, I do my exercise, I get myself cleaned up and I'm ready to go for the day. And it's nonstop until I'm gone to sleep. And I'm having fun. Yeah. I'm loving every moment of it because yeah. I feel like I'm fulfilling my life purpose. Right. Um, right. There have been times, and I'm sure you both have experienced this, uh, it's not easy every day. Sometimes yeah. I get to the point where I say, man, I'm so sick of people and their, their selfishness and they, their carelessness. Mm -hmm. and, and, and they set these bad examples right. for one another and they mm -hmm. hate on each other. And then... Next moment, I said, but that's where I come in to set the good examples and to encourage people. And it may not be a million people uh, saying, I like what you're doing or, send, or, 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 or giving good comments, but I've gotten messages through Facebook Messenger. I've gotten text messages where people who won't comment on Facebook for whatever reason, they give me words of encouragement, said, please keep doing what you're doing. If I go a day without uh, posting a message or I'm late posting it for whatever reason, I get a message saying, Hey man, what's up with the message? Because I All depend right. on that message. And so those type of things, that's the ammo being put into my weapon Yeah, to keep firing, to keep firing and keep fighting because I can't stop. I won't stop. And I, and then the thing is, I don't want to stop. I'm looking for ways. I'm looking for connections with other like-minded individuals to make this thing work because people need help. People need help. And uh, it takes people like us uh, to be willing, not just able, but willing mm -hmm. to, um, to continue to fight. Uh, uh, there's a, uh, uh, when we're talking about the Bible and Jesus, uh, it says Jesus chose 12 ordinary men to be his apostles. Right. Twelve ordinary men. No, they weren't scholars and people of great stature. They were just ordinary men. And the difference in those guys was they were willing to follow him and to do what he said to do and interpret it how you will. That's the way I interpret it. I'm willing to go. I'm not the smartest individual. I'm not the strongest I'm not the most skilled at this or that, but I am very willing to learn and I'm very willing to put forth a hundred percent effort to make it work. And that's what counts. That's what gets me by every single day and linking with people like that. My energy goes from, I'm not going to say zero to a hundred. I'm going to say a hundred to a thousand. Cause I know then, you know, it's like being in, in a group of people, group of, friends right and you're out and you experience some trouble say some 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 crazy person is wanting to to fight right or whatever and if you're alone and this group of guys come over and they want to hurt you you're vulnerable but if you got your team with you you feel empowered and that's what i feel uh being around like-minded minded individuals i have a team of uh strength to help fortify what my goal is yeah Yeah. One thing I didn't forget um, that you mentioned earlier is that you had a conversation with that guy um, in the military 
and you changed him from being a racist to being an open, open-minded person. Can you share with us what you talked with him? Do you remember the words or? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah I, I do. I, I mean, <laughs> this is a story, like I said, you'll never forget those moments. No. Uh, I was sitting on my bunk. I was raised um, by, like I said, my mother and my grandmother, right? So um, one thing was very, very clear to me. Once you get up in the morning and you make your bed, never sit on the bed. So I didn't sit on my bed and I didn't want anybody else sitting on my bed. So when we make our bunks in the, in the army, you know yourself, John, we had to make them crisp, bounce a quarter off those things, right? right. And um, so I'm there by my wall locker and I hear this and everybody's really getting angry and I'm, 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 I'm clueless. Like, what is going on? And I hear this guy yelling out his racist comments and statements and calling people names. And I take a peek around and I look. And I see this little sawed off white guy, right? And he's a little tank looking guy. But he's not afraid. We got, I got a guy, my bunk buddy was a guy by the name of Tim Jones from uh, Columbus, Georgia. He was a big country boy football player. So he's probably like 6'4". He was a big man. And this little sawed off guy's over there talking. I'm like, he ain't afraid of nothing, man. He must really be full of hate is what I'm thinking. But being 17 years old, straight off the block, I didn't know much of anything. I had stopped going to church years before that. So I couldn't quote scriptures or anything like that. The only scripture that I was uh, familiar with basically to roll off my tongue was, uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son and the shortest scripture in the Bible, Jesus wept. And I wasn't over there trying to say those things to him. Something rose up in me and I went around the wall locker and I sat on that guy's bed, this racist guy. I sat on his bed and I said, man, sit down and talk to me. He said, what the, what are you doing? And I said, man, please just sit down and talk to me. And we talked for maybe 45 minutes. People would pass by looking and snarling and, you know, we're going to get you and these things. But I was able to hold his attention because I listened mm -hmm. what he was saying. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I said to him that I think really made a difference was, um, you're white and I'm black. There's Hispanics here. There's a couple of Asian guys here. Some guys from Puerto Rico. I said, but we're all the same, man, because look at the uniform we're wearing. We're all the same. We're fighting for the same purpose. And he stopped and he looked at me and it was a weird look. I didn't know what he was going to say, but he just burned out crying. And I think that was the turning point for him. Yeah. And like I said, he became one of my best friends in life. We stayed together. I was in a cohort unit. So we all stayed together uh, through basic and AIT and for the three years of our first duty station. So uh, when I needed money to send home, this guy would lend me money. When I needed to borrow mm -hmm. his truck, he would mm -hmm. lend me his truck. And this is and people could not believe it. What did you say to him? I said, I didn't say anything, man. I didn't say anything because I didn't know anything to say. It was just mm -hmm. being uh, present, showing up and yeah. being a friend, being uh, someone uh, maybe like, um, I guess you could consider it to be um, like a listening device where he poured out and I was able to really listen and hear him. Mm -hmm. And then when he, when he stopped talking, I was able to give him just a few words of encouragement, a few words. And, and maybe he looked at it as this little guy, this young guy is telling me that I've never heard before. That didn't really make sense. Um, so that basically, without using a bunch of profanity, that's basically how it went. We were, I, was, I couldn't tell him about marriage. I couldn't tell him about kids because I had none of that. Couldn't tell him about much of life because I was only 17 years old. Only thing I knew was coming out of high school, what I did in high school and what I aspired to be. That was the only things that I could say that would probably be meaningful. But whatever it was, it worked. And mm -hmm. I don't say I changed his life. I was used in such a spiritual way to, to institute change in his 
in, in his heart. Mm -hmm. I believe that what you think flows to your heart. Then once you begin to feel it, it become, it comes out of your mouth and out of your actions. Mm -hmm. So I believe you think positive. You, you say some things, you're going to say the things that you think. So think positive. Oh, they say, take your time. Patience is a virtue. So think before you speak. Think mm -hmm. about it. Think about the ramifications if they'll be. In. Think about the benefits if they'll be. In. Think about how this person's feelings uh, may be impacted if you say what you're going to say and how you're going to say it, things of that nature. So uh, at a young age, I was able to, I don't know where I got it from, but it, no, I think I do know where I got it from. My grandmother. Yeah, I said something once. My mom spanked me for doing something I definitely shouldn't have been doing. And I was probably about seven years old at the time. And I said, I hate myself. I was crying. And I sat on the basement steps. And I said, I hate myself. My grandmother said, what did you say? I said, I hate myself. She says, come here. And she took me down into the basement. And if you think my mother spanked me, my grandmother destroyed me in that basement. Mm -hmm. She said, I'm wow. doing this because you never ever, ever will ever say that again. You never mm -hmm. say you hate yourself. And I began to see things differently. I was able to tell a child that um, years ago, a uh, child said that in front of me that they hated themselves. And I was able to use that same logic that my grandmother gave me, passed on to me, to that child. And um, so it's all about loving yourself. Mm -hmm. How can I love you if I don't love myself? How can I be of any type of uh, support or happiness for you if I don't have happiness and genuine happiness in my own heart? Um, so it starts with what I think. Uh, so when I got to that particular point, I was at a low. I was at a real low because my father wasn't there. I was just a teenage boy. I didn't know a whole lot. Other guys knew things their father taught them. Uh, I didn't have those, uh, those moments but I did have deep inside of me a will to do good, to do better. That's what stopped, stopped me from going out with those guys that night. Cause I, I was going to the army. I said, I'm going to go to the army, but I made a decision to stop, to, 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 to put all my energy towards making that a reality. So when they knocked on the door, I said, no, I'm done with that. Had I went out just one last time, I could probably, well, I've kind of probably met John Estine in prison. <laughs> wow. yeah. you know, so it's, it's things like that that um that bring me back to the moment where three days or well, it was actually two months later from that particular point two months later when i told the guy no i'm not going with you two months later i was being used to change that guy's life yeah awesome. yeah uh, such a beautiful story and thank you so so much for sharing this because i feel it's so important nowadays And it's the only way to approach racism. If you see that those people are fear driven, they are scared and they don't trust. And if you approach them with love, if you give them the presence um, without getting involved with their thoughts and then, you know, sucked in. But if you like you did at 17, cut through the BS with your heart then you can change people. You have to break them open with your kind uh, presence. And, and this is the only way we can conquer that ugly thing called racism. Um, I agree. That is such a precious story to, to share. Um, John, is there anything you would like to add? Yes. Um, he had a resident had said something earlier that spoke, you know, about concerning Uh, being used, you know, by God and stuff. And that was my thing too. I learned that, you know, my prayer life, this was my prayer. You know, if you can use anyone, you can use me. So that was my moment of submission right there. You know, when I made that prayer, then my prayer, it, might, it, it grew to this. Um, God, give me wisdom, knowledge, understanding that I may walk uprightly 
and lead your people in the righteous path. That was my prayer throughout during time in you know, Angola. Mm-hmm. And as a result of all that, I see doors opening. And as we all know, that a lot of people went home on the Esteen case, which God orchestrated, I believe, wholeheartedly. And it was a reason why they went home before me, because he wasn't finished with me yet. And when that moment came, when God completed everything that he wanted to complete in my life there, and wanted to bring me to bigger and better things, then that was that time. And that's where I went on the part and parole board. So therefore, my case wasn't for me. It was for everybody else. It was God's doing, and my freedom is God's doing through the part and parole board, and I'm not he's still not finished with me yet. I have 80 years of parole left. <laughs> you know, so, yes. And my end of my message, I want to say, is that, like Reginald reiterated, is to never give up. Continue doing what you're doing in your heart that you feel is right, and it's, and it's your purpose Continue doing that until you are comfortable and happy, like my boy Reginald is, happy every day doing what he's doing. Yes. So that's why that's my, that's my word for the day. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, Reginald, would you like to, to close our conversation here? I would love to. I, um, you know, like I said, it make, it's, it's easy when I um, connect with like-minded individuals, people with high energy. And focus. I um, contacted John today because I was so anticipating this interview. I didn't think I was going to say much. I was just going to uh, listen in. But um, I'm always ready, uh, always ready uh, to add, uh, to be included. Um, and that's important. I think uh, uh, not just not giving up, but staying ready, staying prepared, staying, uh, uh, I guess, fulfilled with information, uh, paying attention to what's going on around you. And uh, that's, that's one thing that I always told my kids, uh, pay attention to every single moment of your life, everything that you go through, pay attention because you'll be able to use it down the road at some point uh, to either take yourself to another level or to con- keep yourself from falling to a level you don't need to be, or to encourage others uh, Mm -hmm. based off of your journey. Not just running your mouth, but your lifestyle is going to be one of the most important aspects of uh, of helping someone else reach the pinnacle of uh, what it is they're trying to do and reach Mm -hmm. and realize their goals. Uh, So today, this has been a blessing to me. This has been really encouraging and it gives me uh, a bit more of uh, uh, insight of what my purpose is. Uh, I know now that I'm not alone in this fight and on this journey and it helps going forward to know that you're in Alberta, Canada and John Estine is in Louisiana. I'm here in Florida. You're intersecting like a triangle and we're going to spread out and canvas this entire world based off of uh, our particular purpose being aligned together. So thank yeah. you for having me. Yes. Thank you so much for taking the time and being here with us. And John, you are incredible. You yeah, are such an enrichment of my life. And it's been so wonderful to connect with you. And thank you for introducing me to um, Reginald that I think it was wonderful. It was so well. great. <laughs> I knew you would enjoy him. He's a great guy. You know, I felt him. Uh, he encouraged me. And if he encouraged me, he encouraged many more. And I know I, he, I needed him on this. I, I wanted people, I wanted the world to hear Reginald Joseph. I wanted him here. He's a great guy. Yes, he is. Thank you, John. I appreciate that. And I also appreciate you, Aurora. I look forward to many more, many more of yes. these. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I feel Wait it was not the last time. <laughs> Thank you so, so much. Happy. Yeah, I really hope you enjoyed our conversation and feel inspired and yeah, never give up as hopeless as some situation may seem. Know that sometimes we just have to fight through the situation and inspire other people afterwards to do the same.
you're never alone. Take good care of yourself and I'm sure we will be back out there for you very soon again. Thank you very much for listening. Bye-bye. Aurora.